a lot of these Silicon Valley tech guys call themselves entrepreneurs, but they get the funding because of my dad's related to Uncle Tom, Uncle Peter Thiel. And next thing you know, they're buying the business. So I like to keep it very old school. I'm an old school entrepreneur. I like to buy for $1 and I like to sell for three. So the entrepreneurs today are thinking about who can cover my bills while I build this baby out. That's not entrepreneurship. What can you do when you have no money in your pocket? How creative can you become? How innovative? That's the true mark of an entrepreneur. My phone did it. We positioned ourselves as a hip hop brand of the telecoms industry. When we were going to these events every year, Mobile World Congress, our booth would be the most packed. Why? Not because we had the best technology. I had the hottest women on my booth because I knew that it was a male dominated industry. So the guys would just come talking to the girls, but after a while they can't talk. They've got to now engage with, oh, that's the product, whatever. And that's how we started getting a lot of brand affinity. We may not have been the best technology product, but we had a lot of brand awareness because people associated us with lifestyle. On today's episode, Alfesh Patel sharing life lessons of a seasoned entrepreneur. Alfesh, hello. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the beginning. Tell me about the world that you're up to and the influences that were important for you to become who you are today. I'm going to have to start right at the beginning. I think, you know, um, being one of the first refugees coming to the UK when we were kicked out by Idi Amin in 1972, uh, going from a life of extreme comfort to a life, life of extreme discomfort, you're kind of thrown into the deep end and learn how to swim on your own. I think that was a real kind of life-changing moment for me, especially being six years old. It's like it kind of defined everything I do after that. So you had a very comfortable life and then all of a sudden everything It was just all changed. taken away. It was all taken away. You know, there's actually a clip on BBC TV of me and my brother getting off the plane with our pillows. This was in 1972. And really, you know, the UK was a very hostile place at that time, especially for people of color. And coming from a life of extreme comfort to now my mom, for example, having three jobs a day here, cold weather. So it was really like complete opposites of what we were used to. So what do you do? Sink or swim? That's basically it. And that's kind of like defined my existence since then about just making sure that you survive at no matter what, at all costs. Mm. So it taught you that survival instinct? Yeah, taught you the survival instinct, taught you about not relying on anyone. You know, we had lots of uh, support in that comfort group, but then that support is taken away. You, you're basically on your own. You know, I always uh, say that uh, you should not rely on anyone because even in the darkness, your shadow will leave you. <laughs> so how was that integration in, in UK for you? And your family? Well, look, I mean, I think it was tougher for my mom because she was much more mature. She was conscious of what's going on. I was only six years old. So it was more difficult for her. A lot of respect for any parents who came over here and had to basically start from scratch and make sure that the kids were taken care of. It was, um, it was tough. It was tough, more so on my, on my mom than, than, than me. But, you know, we just get used to it. Kids get used to things very quickly. You didn't get your first job until you were 33. Yeah. Instead, you became an entrepreneur straight away. Yeah. So what was your first business experience and what did you learn from it? So I would say that uh, the word entrepreneur is now obviously glamorized and all that. But, you know, entrepreneur really, I mean, I was a trader. I became a trader, right? And my first stint at trading was when I just got into University of Hull. I got the student grant because I was on government kind of like a uh, deal. Uh, they give you the grants. And I said, you know, I really wanted to travel. I had this urge in me to travel. So my first uh, vacation, which is the Christmas period after the term starts in September, I said, you know what, I want to go to Morocco. So I just like looked at the map and say, where can I go? And I just said Morocco and said, okay, what can we do there and be able to now bring back to university and sell? So and you, had, you straight away knew that it would be selling something. I said, I wanted to do something that was going to make my trip worthwhile because I'm not really into museums and galleries, right? So I said, let's just go. So I Got a couple of my mates from university. I said, come, come along with me. So we went to Morocco and I used all my grant money to basically buy fake leather goods. I'm not proud of it, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> but right? how, how did that idea even come to your mind? Because we went there and we said, shit, look at this market. And we saw this Louis Vuitton and all that. I'm like, you know what? If we buy some of this stuff, we can actually sell it back to the kids in university. Because there was a market for that. Well, there was a market. I said, we're going to create a market. Because there's a lot of wealthy kids who came to that university, especially the Nigerian kids. And I started hanging out with a lot of the Nigerians from then. And for me, they were extremely flamboyant and 
boisterous and and very proud and 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 vocal and i'm like wow i mean i'd never seen africans like like this because i'm from africa but i didn't grow up in africa because of you know being living in the uk so i was like fascinated by by the nigerians i'm like you know what i need to get in there somehow so i brought back these goods and next thing you know all the nigerians bought my stuff <laughs> just like <laughs> right? that so it was the market ready for you the market was ready because i, mean, because I made sure that the belts were nice, the bags were nice. Listen, everyone knew it was copies, right? This is not the real stuff. But at that time, you know, we were 18-year-olds. We were trying to, make, trying to make a little bit of money here and there. But I then basically used that opportunity to get pre-orders. And then I went to Morocco like four times before the end of the, the first year. So I kept on going back and forth every holiday. And that's how I really managed to start making some money in university. How old were you then? 18. 18. And it was fascinating because it was like, there was, there's no internet, there's no information. You go to the library and you look up Morocco and you say, okay, which city am I going to go to? And I said, okay, Tangier. We went to Tangiers. Completely random. Completely random. Can you tell me um, a memory that really stuck with you from that trip in uh, Morocco? Yeah. It's like, listen, we were like three 18-year-olds, kind of shit scared because we've seen the movies, right? So you see Midnight Express and all of these movies, right? So you say, hang on a minute. And next thing you know, you're going through the through the alleys of the souks with these Moroccan guys who you don't know. They just said, look, um, we can take you and we can show you what we have and all that. So we're just going with our instinct, but there's a little bit of a fear that what, if we, what happens if we're going down the wrong path here? Like something might happen to us. We may get kidnapped. We may, something might happen. So it's that adrenaline rush. And, you know, it's a thing that if they're all talking in Arabic and you like kind of scared that, and, you know, Arabic is a rough language. Mm -hmm. It's not when you hear it, even though they're saying nice things, it can sound quite unpleasant to someone who doesn't know it. So we thought they were getting aggressive, they were getting violent, but actually they were just trying to negotiate with us on the price. <laughs> so anyway, next thing you know, we're in this little back door somewhere in the souk and all of a sudden, you know, the curtains just open up and this guy comes in with the bags and the shoes and the bags and the, and the belts and everything. And it was like a proper bazaar. It's like they were they were really fascinated that we actually wanted to buy all this stuff. And it was just, you know, like I say, what we saw and what was afterwards, it was completely different. We were a little bit worried. Tell me about the negotiation, because I know Morocco is the capital of negotiation. How did you manage that? I managed it very well. And, you know, last week I was in Istanbul and I went to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul and it brought back so many memories because we negotiated the hell out of the bazaar mm. last week. My friend lost his luggage, so he wanted to buy everything from scratch. So we went crazy. And it just reminded of me walking on the streets of Tangiers, negotiating with these guys where you start at X and you end up at Y, you know? And it's like, you just know that everything... So if they is, ask you 100, how much should you actually I think, buy I think, I, think, I think in general, you should always settle for a third. Good yeah, to know. That's, 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 that's my rule. Always settle for a third. But at the end of the day, you've got to walk out of their feeling that you've got something. And they've got to walk out of their feeling they've got something. Hmm. It's called a win-win, hmm. right? So I may have been able to get it cheaper, but then if I walk away, I may have regretted not buying it. One tip for a good negotiator. I just walk away. <laughs> so don't be afraid to... Don't be lose. afraid of walking away, you know, and most of the time they'll come back after you. Yeah. Fair enough. As you said, these days, it's very glorified, the whole side hustle, entrepreneur, idea of being an entrepreneur it's like being a rock star these days can you tell us about the things people need to be ready for that are not so often talked about if they decide to embark on a path of entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is probably one of the toughest things you can do on this planet right entrepreneurship is all about jumping off a cliff and trying to build a plane on the way down right most people do not have the support systems to build that plane on the way down and what happens you crash you crash and burn You've got to take a leap of faith. At the end of the day, the only person that can really, truly make, motivate you is yourself. And you've really got to believe in what you're doing. You've got to have something that's got 110% conviction behind it. The problem is you don't want to get it caught up in your own hype. Because you can always say, oh, I've got a brilliant product and everyone's going to love it. But the reality of it is, is, is their product market fit? What, what do people think about it? What do people think about your idea? You know, your friends and family will always be there to say, yeah, great, well done, super, love If you're it. lucky. If you're lucky. But the truth of the matter is, how are you going to scale this business out? There's a lot of facets to entrepreneurship. And what I find strange about entrepreneurship today, which is quite sad, is that 
The guys who've raised 10, 20 million dollars, they're not really entrepreneurs. They're good at raising money. But have they actually created a viable, sustainable, revenue generating business that people like? A lot of these Silicon Valley tech guys call themselves entrepreneurs, but they get the funding because of my dad's related to Uncle Tom and Uncle Peter Thiel and all of that. Next thing you know, they're buying the business. So I like to keep it very old school. I'm an old school entrepreneur. I like to buy for $1 and I like to sell for three. Today's entrepreneurs, they like to sell for three and buy, uh, sorry, buy for three and sell for, for one or the other way around. And hopefully somebody makes up the difference along the way. And most of that time, that difference is made up by venture capital or private equity investment. So the entrepreneurs today are thinking about who can cover my bills while I build this baby out. Hmm. That's not entrepreneurship. What can you do when you have no money in your pocket? How creative can you become? How innovative? That's the true mark of an entrepreneur, in my opinion. What can you do with nothing? That's very, very important. If you can do that, if you can build a business on your own for the first one year, get product market fit, get some user traction, all on your own back, you've got your own skin in the game, that's going to make people respect you more. That's also going to make yourself respect the money. Because when money gets thrown at you, you don't, get, you don't respect it. That's why you see all these companies are in trouble. They've overspent because they never earned that money. Mm. That's the problem with the world today when it comes to entrepreneurship. Okay. Yeah, that's very solid advice. I feel like people, there's, there's, there's a dilemma between throwing yourself in there and taking chances without knowing necessarily what all the steps are. And also that other extreme where people are just negligent and just using other people's funds. You've created several businesses from scratch, including MyPhone, the first African mobile hardware brand, which together with Oju, a company behind world's first black emoticon, you later sold to a $5 billion conglomerate. Where did you get the funds to start MyPhone? Very interesting story, actually. Um, I was director of Motorola for many years. So my first corporate role was at 33. And I joined Harris Corporation. Um, I went back to Africa. I ran around the whole continent uh, selling microwave radio networks to GSM operators. So I started getting a lot of experience in the back end of the, how the telecom system works. And I've always done phones from 1989. So that's been my, come, my space. Um, I found it extremely boring talking about network engineering and all that. It's just not me. I'm more of a front end kind of salesy kind of guy. So I got the opportunity to join Motorola. I built a, a pretty substantial business with Motorola, generated $500 million in revenue for them in three years, took them to number one in quite a few markets in Africa. This was going to be another one of my questions, but maybe oh. we can just jump into that before. Yeah. How did you do that? How did you manage to do that? It's the grind. It's the hustle. It's like, it's like just know that, you know, I wanted to prove to my bosses that I'm indispensable. You know, and I think at the end of the day, the people that create the value in companies are those who are considered indispensable. How did you make yourself indispensable? always have the order in your back pocket. I played so many tricks, but genuine tricks, not in a negative sense. For example, I would get three or four purchase orders from my customers. And I know that end last day of the quarter is when the numbers are getting reported. So I know, for example, that one of my colleagues who's running another region, they may not have hit their numbers. So in order to help the team, I would say, here, here's another order. Or if I wanted to get something for next quarter in terms of getting more marketing support for my customers, I'm like, here's another order, right? So that way, you always have something in your back pocket, your ace card. Mm -hmm. Always keep your ace card in your back pocket for end of the quarter. And I learned that from this corporate game where they don't give a damn about anything. They just want to make sure that their quarterly numbers are reported and the management takes the credit for it and his boss takes the credit for it. Whether I get thanks or not, that was not the point. The point is I did what I had to do to make sure that my region is thriving and that I get more support for my region. One of the reasons I left Motorola was the fact that we were in Africa. So had I done the same thing in North America, I would have been a hero. But in Africa, even though my team was all heroes, we didn't get the level of support for the amount of money that we were generating for the company. So I'm like, this is not fair, right? Just because you've got 1 billion people that are earning less than $500 a month doesn't mean that they're not a viable market. And today, Motorola is nowhere. Had they followed what I'd said, it would have been, it would have been the Apple, Black, uh, Samsung, whatever of Africa today. Yeah. Right? 
but what happened was uh, you know management messed up the whole thing so i left knowing that hang on there's there's a little bit more of an opportunity here sorry i just want to bring you mm -hmm. back a little bit mm -hmm. to the um, to the tools that you used in fact to get there so you mentioned anticipating the needs of your clients essentially and being really aware of that i also read in your book uh, which by the way i really recommend tested that you were making friends with the receptionists and yeah. other people in the companies that yeah. you were working with. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. I think it's very important that, you know, when you're dealing with companies, especially what we call strategic selling, if you're selling into big corporates, if you're selling into carriers, if you're selling into telcos, if you're selling into big pharma, pharma companies, it's called strategic selling. You've got to cover all your bases. So I would meet the CTO who would give me the spec, but because they're not commercial, I would have to go and deal with finance. I'm going to have to deal with procurement. And everywhere I'm going, there's always a barrier. There's always a gatekeeper. You've got to make sure that you're best friends with that gatekeeper. And most of the time, it's that receptionist. It's that secretary. It's that person that gets you the appointment with the CEO. It's that person who manages the diaries. It's that person who ensures that your sample gets delivered to the right decision maker. And you've just got to have empathy. You've just got to be able to relate to that person. They're not they're just a receptionist. They've been earning a few, few dollars a month, but they're, they're at the front of the company, literally. They, they, as soon as you walk in, they're at the front of the company and they basically represent their company at the same time. That's your first gatekeeper that you've got to go through. So you've got to embrace and become friendly with everyone. Don't judge because of their title. So you made a point of making friends with those people specifically. I make friends with everyone. And you also- Not, because, not because of an ulterior motive. That's just, um, an ethos of your life. Yeah, I just don't believe that. I don't want to use people. I believe you have to be friendly. You have to, you know, everyone's got their own challenges. Everyone's got their own journey. You've got to be under, able to understand that they've also got, you don't know the journey they had to work that morning. So, you know, if you smile at them, make them feel good, what's wrong with that? No, I completely yeah. agree. Sometimes people that are really numbers driven um, and results driven, they can, in the pursuit of those numbers and results, they might forget the super basic things like just be nice yeah but they actually correlate directly with results yeah practical results financial yeah. results so yeah. like in your case and you would even bring them some little gifts when yeah you... like a bring them a little gift from the duty free i mean i uh you know it's 10 20 dollar little items from the duty free in at the airport just get a few like a box of chocolates or whatever it's not even it's not even bribery it's nothing because no, no, they can't do anything it's, it's just a I just man, just a little gesture to say yeah. listen i'm just came came back from South Africa, I'm here. By the way, it's a box of chocolates for you. Come on, you've made their day. No one else has given them a box of chocolates. Is there any other tool that sticks in your mind that helped you achieve those numbers in Motorola? I think it's just about speed, right? You've got to be able to move fast. You've got to think local, but you've got to move fast. When I say think local, you've got to always customize your offering for that local market. You've got to be able to tell your, um, your client that, make them feel that they you're doing it for them only. No one, they're number one priority. Everything else is secondary. And customize your solutions that, that are going to help them win in the market. And I think the more you can address that, the more you get people to nod their heads. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were telling me about my phone and how you get the funds and how you got going. So when I, yeah, so when I basically, um, I was a top dog at Motorola. So they moved me from uh, South Africa to Dubai. Had a very, very glamorous lifestyle, earning a lot of money because it was tax-free. And, and, you know, because I was generating so much revenue for Motorola, I was getting pretty good commissions. So what I did, I started using those commissions to start putting deposits on property in Dubai. Now, one of the key things in Dubai in 2005 was that there was no credit system. There was no credit bureau. So because I had a job with Motorola, I'd basically go to Bank A and say, here's my salary letter. Can I get a mortgage? Here's my deposit. They'll be like, no problem. When they saw Motorola, they like, no problem. Go to bank B and say, listen, I'm with Motorola. Like, uh, here's my salary letter. Um, here's this 10% deposit. Can I get a mortgage? So you'd mm. use the same salary yeah. letter? Oh <laughs> yeah, my yeah, God. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I went from one bank to another, bank A, bank B, bank, bank C. And I'm like, you know what? Let's just see what happens, right? They didn't have a credit system. So they, bank A didn't know I had a mortgage with bank B. That's just the way it is. Was I doing something illegal? No. No, I wasn't because they approved it. They did their compliance and everything. That way, basically, I amassed a handful of properties over a period of two years, and I started flipping them. I also then used some of that money that I flipped to be able to buy off-plan property, and then I'd flip it to the 10th guy in the queue, right? Because Dubai was manic. 
in 2005, 2006, it was crazy. The amount it's, of people. It's manic again now. It's manic again now. Um, different kind of manic though. So basically, I started generating a lot of income from flipping those properties, and I used this savings. Uh, so when I left Motorola, I, I, I already knew what I wanted to do. It's not like I left Motorola and like sitting around for a year thinking, what's next? I uh, immediately thought of my phone because I saw the problems that having with Motorola where they didn't really address the needs of the market. And I just figured out that, you know, a 16-year-old schoolgirl in Africa has a different mobile need to the 25-year-old cab driver. So how do we create diversity in terms of a product offering at that low level of the market? So that's what we decided to do. And that's why I said, let me set up the first African mobile device hardware um, company. And this was really the first tech hardware startup on the continent. You're talking about 2008. And that's what got us going. And uh, the first two months, I got my first order. How? I went to the carriers. And I knew the, car and I knew the problems with the big brands. So I went to the carrier and said, listen, I can put your logo on this phone next to mine. You can have it co-branded. I can make it the same color as, you, as your corporate color. I can have your wake-up graphics come on the phone. And they were like, really? And I'm like, yeah, because I knew Motorola, Nokia, none of those guys are going to do it. So I used that customization trick to win the pilot with Tigo, one of the uh, operators in Ghana. And when Tigo got that order, they were so happy, they immediately started calling all the other Tigos and saying, listen, you need to deal with our pesh and get your phones. And that's how we just started building. What were the biggest challenges in that business that you encountered? Money, money funding, because I was now funding it out of my own pocket. And from the I'll, real estate. From the real estate, but I'm now giving credit to the carriers, but I know they're going to pay me in 30 days because it's a carrier. So I knew that my, my, my risk was kind of, assured and plus they were giving me orders which i would then go and make so i knew that uh, it was kind of like a back-to-back -back deal but then i think um, a little bit of ego took over where i said you know what this is a nice run let me see if i can do this and that so i started over expanding and i started leveraging my income and my earnings from the carrier business to start saying let's now start setting up a, um, a direct to distribution model let's start going into this country let's start going into that country and Look, within a space of three years, we were in 17 markets. That's not a joke. This is with how big of a team? A handful, probably 10, 15 people. Lots of lessons learned. Share some, lots please. Of, lots of lesson number one. For example, if I was to just stay, stick to one market like Nigeria, I don't need the rest of the continent because Nigeria has 250 million people. If I just focus on one market instead of trying to go to 17, I probably would have made a lot more, more, much more money because my focus is on one market. But when you're 17 markets, you're dealing with Francophone Africa, East Africa, West Africa, Anglophone, you're different with, dealing with different cultures, different people, mm -hmm. different systems, you kind of, your, your efforts get diluted. So the focus was not there, even though it was a continent-wide focus, we could have done better by just focusing on a key one or two countries or one or two regions. So that was, I won't say mistake, it was a learning number one. Try and focus as much as you can. Number two, I, because of the speed of trying to expand, I hired people without really discovering what their real abilities are. So hire the wrong people. You've got to hire the right people. Did you have a system for hiring them or was it more word of mouth? If I like the look of you and mm. like, yeah, you know what, you're talking my language, let's go, right? Which is the way it should be, but people also take advantage of you, nice, uh, of, of you being too nice and saying, okay, let's go. People take advantage. Mm. A lot of people took advantage of the fact that once I took them on, I let them run with it. And in that, in that situation, they kind of ran with everything, but they didn't bring the expertise to the table. I guess the, it has to be a little bit more thorough, the process of hiring. And yeah. I, I was listening to a podcast the other day. I think it was Rob Warren. He was saying that we're with uh, Jordan Peterson and they were talking about how entrepreneurs tend to hire in the beginning, hire people that are like them. And then afterwards, that are, when they learn that that's not what they need, everyone a visionary, everyone an entrepreneur, then they hire people that are opposite to that. And then by the end of the, the journey, they, they yeah. learn to. W did you hire people that were like you, kind of high energy? Well, yeah, I hired people who I thought could really make a difference. But the thing is, they, they, they showed that they could, but, they, but the, the substance wasn't there. Exactly. All right. So now you're starting to now really put out a lot of fires. Uh, you're starting to micromanage, which is not really what you want when, you, when you've got 17 markets. You need to elevate to the next level but I ended up going back into the business to micromanage a lot of things. And then in that micromanaging, you kind of lose your ability to really get results properly, you know, because you're always like, you're just not focusing on the bigger picture.
And that's really, yeah, some of the learnings that we had from, from, that, from that episode. How important is marketing and strong identity, strong brand identity for a new brand to it's succeed? It's everything. It's everything. You could have the baddest technical product on the planet. If no one knows about it, how are you going to move it? You've got to get awareness, marketing, but marketing without distribution is also fail. Like you can market something, but if your product is not ready, you're going to lose that momentum, even though your marketing may be superb. If you don't have distribution in place, how are you going to now supply that product to meet the de demands of that marketing or the results of that marketing? So everything has to be really well-timed, but you've got to be able to do everything in the background. And Apple has got it down to a T. Apple will tell you nothing. Tomorrow they'll launch the iPhone 75. Next thing you know, it's available the next day in the store. Have you noticed that? that yeah. Every time they announce, next day it's available. But they've been planning this stuff for months. It's all about the back-end planning. You've got to plan and your marketing is one aspect of your plan. But it's very important. Branding is key. Branding is your DNA. What is your brand guidelines? What's your ethics? What's your, what's your principles behind this brand? Why is your logo like this? Can you explain your logo? Can you explain your font? Can you explain what your company name means? You also put XYZ Limited. What does it mean? Do you and why did you choose it? Yeah. And why, do you, why are you doing what you're doing? What is your why? That all goes around your brand. Why am I doing what I'm doing today with Zambezi? It's, 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 the, 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 it's, it's the story behind the brand. That's what's going to propel it. And then you have your different stories about your brand, and then you've got to find the right marketing mediums to communicate that message, whether it's digital marketing, whether it's billboards, whether it's influencers, whatever you choose to do. Very important. So it always played a key role for your companies. Yeah. The way my phone did it, we positioned ourselves as a hip hop brand of the telecoms industry. Because if you, you may have read, but you know, when we were going to these events every year, Mobile World Congress, our booth would be the most packed. Why? Not because we had the best technology. I had the hottest women on my booth because I knew that it was a male dominated industry, right? So the guys would just come talking to the girls, but after a while they can't talk. They've got to now engage with, oh, that's the product, whatever. And that's how we started getting a lot of brand affinity. We may not have been the best technological, technology product, but we had a lot of brand awareness because people associated us with lifestyle. You created experience. We created a clients. space, we created a lifestyle. And we created this thing about phones should not just be boring little gadgets. Can you give us some tips as well for the creation of the strong brand identity? Well, that really comes from the founder's conviction. Why did the founder decide to do, why do you want to launch your business? And what's going to make you so different? There's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of competition. In fact, it's getting even more tougher now. My good friend, Robin Sharma is industry, uh, industry thought leader, a great uh, leadership speaker as well. He always told me, you know, when you're trying to do something, don't try and be the best at what you do. Try and be the only one to do what you do. That's how you create a new, new value. That's how you create a new category. So when it comes to creating a new business, when it comes to creating a new brand, how different are you to the others? What is your niche? Is your brand going to create this new category? Are you disrupting the industry? Are you working along with the industry? What is your brand principles? Who is your brand for? I mean, it's a proper in-depth exercise. And that's why some of these companies will charge you like 500 grand for a brand strategy session. I'll charge you 10%. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that's a bit steep. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm telling you, there's a lot of companies out there who are just focusing on just developing your brand. Yeah, that is really important. Because yeah. if you have a very hard and very clear core identity, then it's easier for you to market yourself, to get your point across, to attract the right customer and just survive over the but years. But your brand is also not about the first visual look. I always believe that you don't get a second chance to make that first impression. So your visual look is very important. But your real brand value comes from the user experience. What is, how do you execute on your product delivery? How are you executing on your customer support? Right? All of this is what we call the user experience. The user experience enhances the brand value. It enhances the brand image. If you can provide a really good support for your user, make it simple for them to use your application or your product or your service, they're going to keep on coming back. They're going, to, they're going to be your ambassador and say, tell their friend, listen, you need to use this. Great products tend to do that. That's it. Tell me about a time in your life when you thought, that's it. It's over. I can never recover from this. Yeah, well, that's have to be, that's have to be when I sold my phone to this conglomerate. 
you know, it was a completely different path from there because they funded the business. Uh, but the, the very thing that excited them, they tried to change. This was like a, a very, very massive white South African company. They still had that old kind of like DNA of apartheid and everything. Like they didn't even want us to call ourselves a black brand anymore. Mm. It was like, like that, you know. A lot of challenges in, in, the, in the whole setup. Normally we would do approvals within a couple of days. Now it's taking a month to go through this department, that department. I'm like, come on, guys. We're still a young entrepreneurial kind of company. I think what happened was also then I took Xiaomi to court because Xiaomi came into Africa with the MI brand. And I had the MI brand registered from 2008. Oh, so, so you had I, the conflict of the name. Yeah, they came in. They, 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 they came in much later. So I had my copyright and everything registered with the top lawyers across Africa. And then when Xiaomi came in, I just realized how corrupt this whole system is. Like they just kept on paying the lawyers and my own lawyers told me, um, yeah, um, you know, you're going to have to do this and that. I said, but why did I pay you in the first place to register my trademark? I said, I paid you to register my trademark because of instances like this. But it came to a c case of who's got the deepest pockets. Because of that, I kind of f forgot about building the actual business, getting more into, involved with this legal case. We had a lot of issues with the currency in Nigeria fluctuating and all of that. So it started becoming very, really tough to operate. And basically what happened was I kind of like fizzled out, right? I, I, I literally burnt out. And I said to them, listen, I'm kind of done here. I need to just take some time out. So my phone itself as a brand, even though we had eight years of success, we sold millions of phones on the continent, we sold the business. I'm the first one to say that I am living proof that as an entrepreneur, I, I went from inception to exit, every entrepreneur's dream to sell their company. But, you know, did I get a fat check? Did I get into my private jet? Did I fly off into the sunset? No. Right? No happily ever after. Live happily, ha happily ever after. That did not happen to me. And that does not happen for 99% of the entrepreneurs. And that is the truth that they don't tell you. That's the truth they don't tell you. You know, if, but I know now from the lessons I've learned that, yeah, maybe I am going to fly off into the sunset, but guess what? I'm going to take a billion people with me. Which ties in with your Which new ties projects. in what I'm doing yeah, with my new project. To, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's all about learnings. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's why I took some time out. I, I started, I, I wrote my book. I wrote my book in six weeks. Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you, how did you deal with your burnout? I, had, I, I wrote. I feel that when I write, and I, and I, said, and I advise a lot of people to start writing with your, with your own hands, not typewriting. Mm -hmm. There's a connection between your mind, your body, your soul, and when you write. And things just, you know, your words just flow out. So I just basically sat down. I took two months off and I went to Dar es Salaam. I sat by the beach for two months. And I basically went through my whole journey since my early days of being a refugee. I've got a photographic memory. So I remembered every little aspect of my life that had something to do with entrepreneurship. And I kind of tabulated the whole thing. Then I wrote it out, typed it out. And then obviously, it was like a startup project for me. So I got the best copywriter. I got the best designer. that's the first writing project that you've ever done. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I didn't want to go to a publisher because I knew they're full of shit. Excuse mm. my language. <laughs> um, they're, they're, who am I, right? Oh, African story. Oh, come on, get out of here. So I said, you know, I'm going to do this myself. So I'm a self-published author. And I did this in six months. But I managed to say, get the best copywriter, get the best designer, get someone to proofread best PR company who does book marketing and the book went on to become nominated for a, a UK business book of the year 2018 yes yeah. I, I saw yeah. it's amazing yeah. and, and I read it I, by the way I recommend it to everyone yeah. it's such a great book yeah yeah it's just um, so you cool. know it's, it's, a, it's a roller coaster of a ride sometimes people use it as a sleeping aid but um, it's it, it's something that um, I just had to get out of my system so that yeah. was your way of dealing with the burnout and healing yeah I love that because not only you immediately almost found instinctively a way to deal with that burnout, you also did something incredibly productive, which bore great fruit. Correct. Something that you can leave behind. Okay. And we're all here for 80, 90 years. We can't take anything with us. You leave what you can behind. Now, my book is not about a, uh, a, a book of, you know, how to do things. It's really about a book of how not to do things. Right. And why do I call it Tested is because from the day you're born to the day you die, you go through a series of tests. Some of these tests you will win, but most of the tests you will fail, right? So my book is, is, is not celebrating failure, it's acknowledging that failure is part of the journey. 
and when you start realizing that then you 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 don't take things too 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 crazy at heart you don't beat yourself about uh, beat yourself up because project a didn't 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 succeed so it's just to give people a little bit of a, a push you mm-hmm. know what i mean and then from there i started I, i do a lot of speaking and mentoring young entrepreneurs and then i said what's next and that's really what's got me back up on my feet what is next for you taking well for me it's unfinished business because i said I never really did justice with my phone and now we're going to continue the 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 journey uh which we call uh, zambezi and zambezi is the new platform that we've launched with the busy tokens is a complete new ecosystem that we're creating in the web3 world which is the future a web3 for mobile we're creating the world's first multi-chain smartphone we're creating the world's first multi-chain android app what does that mean multi-chain blockchain so what we're saying right now is especially over the last 3 years you've realized that six or seven companies have become trillion dollar operations right they have taken your data they've taken every time you press that screen on your mobile phone somebody is getting rich off your little ip but the user themselves are not getting rewarded so we wanted to create a system where the user themselves are at the center of everything and the user gets created for your shopping sharing searching but we want to reward you in tokens because imagine if apple had given you a token the first time you bought your first iphone how much would that token be worth today right so we want to instill a a a a savings mentality hold on to your tokens because they're going to increase in value and then if you want to redeem your tokens you can redeem it to pay your phone bill you can redeem it to pay your electricity bill your gas bill why because our focus is on africa middle east to latin america where we believe that billions of people have been left behind in this digital ecosystem but the people are still using their phones every day if you can reward my whole aim right now is to make sure i empower 1 billion people on this planet to earn a few dollars every month for life from just doing exactly what they're doing on their phones today paying attention to different media essentially getting rewarded for their screen interactions because yeah. they're not going to get it from apple and samsung that's a web 2 world that's a centralized world mm-hmm. we're going to a decentralized world so the whole thing is now become a completely new exciting thing for me why same thing one from motorola days because i know apple and samsung are not going into web 3 straight away they're like massive cruise ships they're going to take them 2 to 3 years to steer and they're so busy yanking everyone's money right now so you have a massive advantage because you don't have that size we're a speedboat mm-hmm. we pivot straight away and the fact is that we've got some good people behind us we've got very good momentum we've got great partners with these blockchain networks we're launching this week actually oh yeah. congratulations well launching in the sense that you buy our zebra nft it's a collector's item and you get the web3 you'll be one of the first to get the web3 phone for free mm. right and what we're saying is i know you're not going to leave your iphone why don't you give that phone to someone in the community who needs a hand up in life that's how you start lifting communities we call it a hand up as opposed to a handout start helping people around you to start earning a few dollars every month and that's how we're going to change community how how we're going to uplift communities that's my that's my uh, mission and aim right now because you can't take it with you you know i don't mind having a earning a billion dollars i don't mind earning 100 million dollars i can't take it with me when you appreciate and understand what i'm trying to say then you know oh, hang on a minute i can't take it with me so i'm not going to just try and be the only one on the table eating i want to eat with everyone i was going to ask you have you found your purpose and what's your relationship with that word i think i'm getting closer to my purpose it sounds like yeah. you have kind of well i'm it. getting closer to my purpose and my purpose has not been something that just came to me one day i think it's that journey that i've been on just finally just trying to find exactly what i'm meant to do on this piece of rock and i believe everyone has a purpose but as pablo picasso says you know the 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 meaning of life is to find your gift Now, the mm-hmm. purpose of life is to give it away because you, you can't take it with you <laughs> yes you know so yeah i mean i'm just really excited about what's going on right now even though the world is in a lot of pain it's a, it's very difficult out there it's very difficult there's um you can see what's happening political divide and conquer covid it, it's 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 the, the empathy has been taken away that we once had you know we don't have that interaction anymore people are going on their phones that's one one world and then what they see every day that's another world and i think uh whatever we can do to bring that empathy back is going to be very important yeah i completely agree and i think community plays a big role in that 
So to be very inclusive, to be very empathetic, as you said, to include as many people that you can help as possible yeah. in your community. Yeah. yeah. If you had to attribute your success to one skill that you have, what would it be? I think I'm a people person, really. I just, um, I've, been in, I've lived in so many different cultures and I've been, I've visited more than 100 countries. I know, I know like what buttons to press when I'm speaking with someone in terms of like, I, I probably know where they're from, a little bit about their culture, a little bit about their country and that's how you start creating a little bit of a bond where you, where, in, from an emotional perspective, you know, where you start building that little relationship. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not an admin guy. I'm not a process-driven guy. But I kind of realize where my strengths lie and then where my weaknesses are, I want to kind of fill those gaps by hiring really good people. That's really, really clever. Yeah. And I really resonate with you when you say that you're a people's person. I am as well. <laughs> and I think, I think you have to be, even in any business, even if we're talking about business, let, us, let alone just having a, a full life, you get that by connecting with people and by interacting with them, learning from them, helping them. But even the business side, I think any person that walks into their field with this desire to serve and to help people and the general liking of people is going to have tremendously more success in what they're doing than the one that doesn't. Definitely. And, you know, as leaders in our industry or as founders, I would say, the best founders, the best things I've seen on stage is where you don't even have a, you don't even have a presentation behind you. When I go into a room now, I don't, I don't carry laptops. I don't carry PowerPoint slides. I explain my product to you. you, you obviously, it's, it, it, you, you either like it or you don't. But what I'm saying is very important on any founder to be able to sell their vision as a story. Like you've got to be very good at storytelling. And I think you are being the, being the forefront of your company is what's going to get everyone else to follow your vision, right? So it's very, very important that, that you present everything in the right way. And am I talking sense here? Have I, have I yeah, digressed? Yeah, yeah. It's very important for the founder to talk sense, to be, to be passionate. Know that the, the, the aim here is, can you present your vision without having any backup material? If you do that and you do that in a convincing way, you're going to get a lot of followers. You're going to get a lot of people buying into your vision. That's probably why people like Adam Newman from WeWork are so, were so successful because... I think it was Warren Buffett that said that the best investment he ever made in his life was the public speaking course that he did when he was young. You've got to be able to tell your story. You've got to be able to tell your story and the story of your business in a very convincing manner. And there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a trick to it. There's, a, there's, a, there's obviously some, some skill involved, but I think it's going to come from practice. And... If you're a shy founder, I got, you got problems. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. That's definitely a skill worth investing in. Yeah. So as an ending tradition, mm -hmm. Alpesh, can you tell me your recipe for happiness? Ooh, that's very, very subjective. I think for me, it's just, for me, what's really got me invigorated again is, you know, I've got 20-year-old daughter, I've got an 18-year-old daughter, and then three years ago, I was blessed with another daughter. Congratulations. And it kind of brought me back down to fatherhood again where you kind of like forgot all of those skills. Now, if that's, if, 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 if she is what brought the best out of me in from a loving perspective, then, then that's, my, that's my thing, right? I think you've got to really do everything with love. You've got to do really enjoy what you're doing. If you don't enjoy it, don't do it, you know? If you don't enjoy working where you're working, then start planning. For something else. You've got to be happy. You've got to be happy in the moment. Tomorrow is not promised. Right? Yesterday is the past. You've got to be happy in the moment. I'm really happy that I'm here talking with you. And I'm happy that you're doing this. Because hopefully I'm going to be part of your journey. And part of your success going forward. Right? Listen, I'm telling you right now, if you get a million viewers, <laughs> just remember I was here first. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> right? you're, you're, in, you're in the community. <laughs> in, in, in a caucus. And it, I'm really happy for you, what you're doing. Thank you. You know, and at the end of the day, I think, I think that's how we're going to build each other because I can't do what you're doing. You can't do what I'm doing. Very true. You know? But together we can do something greater. There's great things. Yeah. So yeah, happiness for me is, is my little girl. And I think that's brought a lot of joy back into my life. 
that I was missing over the last five years because of this uh, business thing. And I think I've been able to put that joy into something, uh, into saying, this is the next thing that's coming. But everything I do now is with a lot of joy. Yeah, even though it's tough. So you almost guide yourself intuitively. You feel, you take note of what you're feeling, and then you decide whether this is the right path and the right direction for you or not. I think after a while, you know, you get used to knowing what's good. You can feel energy around you. You know, you walk into the room, you're like, oh, shit, I I don't want to be here. Mm. I've walked into a place, I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to be here. It's just that feeling in the air. You've got to trust that instinct of yours. And I think that puts you in the in the right uh, in the right environment. At the end of the day, you've got to surround yourself with 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 success. You know, very famous uh, saying. You know, if you hang out with five billionaires, you might be the sixth. Right? You've got to start surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you. You do not want to be the smartest guy in the room. That's a big mistake. I was like I was that guy for many years. I was I was. Everyone came to me for all the solutions. And I thought, yeah, I'm the guy. You know? But the <laughs> thing is, I'm in the wrong room because yeah. I'm not learning. So you've got to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. This is actually a, a very, very interesting point. I've uh, heard this a lot of times before. And the instinctive first thought that I had was, yes, this is where I want to be. I definitely want to be learning always from people around me. But the question that I would pose is, okay, but what am I bringing to the table for these amazing, clever, more clever people? And yeah, that's a very good point. I did a talk two years ago at a Diwali dinner and it was full of billionaires. Full of billionaires. I'm like, what am I going to say to all these billionaires? Like, what can I tell them? But I managed to give them a talk. And I made a lot of good friends after that because I said, guys, is it really about chasing money? You know, I kind of put it back to them. Okay, you're billionaires. Are you really happy? Are you Superman? Are you, is your health brilliant? Have you put aside everything that you've always wanted to do because you were chasing this money? You know, so you always have something to contribute. That's what I believe. And the classic example is you've got to read the latest tweets from Elon Musk, who's just trashed the whole myth about the tech genius. If you read the tweets that Elon Musk has sent between him and the Twitter folks, you will realize that this guy's nothing. This guy's not that special. He's actually quite dumb. So Very controversial statement well, right I'm here. I'm telling you right now. Now, when I say quite dumb, you've got to read the tweets. I'm relating to the tweets. Mm-hmm. I'm relating to the articles that I've read where Silicon Valley and raising money is an old boys club, right? But what is the substance behind what they're doing? Have they really thought about this thing? You've got to read that and say, hang on a minute. A lot of this world is perception, is, is BS. It's all BS. As long as you know, when you come into that table, you've got that little bit to contribute. There's something you know that Elon Musk does not know. I can it's guarantee very, very you true. that. Something that you know, Dana, that Elon Musk does not know. Well, I'm coming from Latvia. I'm sure, I'm sure I do. <laughs> but I'm telling you. Yeah. Right? So well, That's very yeah. true. I guess that also emphasizes the point of not putting other people on the pedestal and at the same time being aware and grateful and appreciative of our own talents and value that we can bring. And this is the myth of the entrepreneur, the tech genius, the tech whiz. Elon Musk, uh, Adam Newman, all that. They've created these followings. People say, oh, Elon Musk is my hero, blah, blah, blah. They don't realize that they're also heroes. But because they're so busy praying to this dude, they're forgetting about praying themselves, into themselves. Focus on yourself. That's what I'm trying to say to you. You're as good as anyone else out there. Don't underestimate just because he's a billionaire that you don't have the skill set. Do you understand? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everyone has something. To Everyone has to something. You've got to start respecting yourself. You've got to start loving yourself. And you've got to say, listen, I know something that no one else does. And it's also a matter of bringing a fresh perspective. Like the bigger the gap between, say, I walk into this room with, I don't know, 70-year-old Parisian tech entrepreneurs. It's a bad, bad example, 70-year-old tech entrepreneurs, but, you know, whatever. And I have a completely different life story coming from different countries, done completely different experiences. So if they have a question, they're all thinking about it from a perspective of their group. Correct. So that cannot be undervalued. Correct. Correct. And because it's an all boys network, this whole Silicon Valley, it's guys giving money to each other. They all know each other. They believe that they know everything. 
Yeah, they can be out of, uh, out out of touch, touch with reality. Yeah, yeah, they're out of touch. They're out of sync. They don't know what the guy on the street is going through. And that's why you can, you can see today how they build their businesses. Please pick up the phone right now and call Facebook customer service. Call Google and see if they answer the phone. They don't even give you a number. They have blocked themselves from your issues, but they're taking all the stuff from you. That is what you've got to start looking into. You've got to like, there's signals everywhere that something is not right. Now, can you change it with what you bring to the table? Go ahead. Do you understand? 100%. You can't call Facebook today. Well, you certainly can't call Instagram. I've had so many friends you can't. whose accounts have been hacked, yeah. blocked yep. for no reason. Yep. And they, it was actually yeah. their business. Yeah. They had, I don't know how many thousands of followings. Correct. They're blocked Correct. and you can't, there's no number to call. I found that completely outrageous. Correct. Meanwhile, Instagram, every time you put up a post, every time you put up a picture, they're using the algorithms. They're monetizing that. They're selling it to some advertisers somewhere. You're not getting nothing for it. And when you have an issue, they're not even there for you. Do you think that's fair? Certainly not. Exactly. It's because we've been dumbed down with consumerism. These old tech companies have made us feel that phones and mobile is all about taking selfies and, and all of that. It's for not. them. It's all bullshit. Yeah. Excuse my language. Well, we digress massively from yeah. happiness to this. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much, Alpesh. This yeah. has been amazing. And thank you for Thanks coming Thanks for the chat. This. Thank you very much. Really happy to be here and wishing you all the success on your journey going forward. Thank you, Alpesh. Cheers. Thank you. Hello friends, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe and share it with someone. I would love to hear your feedback and suggestions as to what guests you would like to see on the show next. See you next week.